Uh, Mary Jo is from uh, Stony Brook University. Uh, she is uh, one of the uh, leading uh, writers in uh, Italian American studies. She also is in the English department and in uh, gender studies as well. Uh, and uh, we're lucky to have her. Uh, the commentator will be uh, my partner, Gloria Nardini, uh, who is the author of Ma Che Bella Figura. Is there a Ma in there? No, or, no Ma Che Bella Figura, a uh, study of the Italian women's club in Chicago. And uh, we're all set. Uh, we'll turn it over to Mary Jo, who will speak to, uh, about uh, Kathy. There it is. Um, thank you for hanging out here just a little bit longer. Um, I come from a Catholic background, and I think we can fast just a little bit longer, even though I truly am starting. Offer it up for the first uh, time. Offer it up to, I don't know, Santa Rosalia or something, uh, or someone like that. Um, I, I want to warn you, I was given a little bit more time, but I do speak very fast, so I'll go through it. Um, and I want to thank Mark and uh, Dom and Loyola for inviting me, and Tony Arzone sitting there very quietly in the back. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, let me begin. Capitalizing only two words in her entire poem, Italian and St. Anthony, Elaine Romaine semantically diminishes the power of Irish domination uh, and the conventional ritual of the Catholic sacrament of communion in her poem, You Were Always Irish God. Romaine's description of the annual festa also illustrates its association with patriarchy. I tried to use the most phallic image I could find. Um, as, as only male figures, most likely Italian, priests, father, uncles, and brother, are involved in the sacred outdoor procession. By the end of the poem, in an apostrophe of exhausted resistance, Romaine makes her own confession. Oh God, God, I have nothing to confess. Uh, overtly distancing herself from church hierarchy, this poet voices a loyal dissension from a distinctly American incarnation of Catholicism, maintaining ties with an Italian cultural heritage that recognizes the sacred in the everyday. And all the sights of you, God, were wine-filled. Today, I would like to recognize the sacred in the everyday by focusing my comments on two Chicago storytellers, Rosa Casateri and Tony Ardenzoni. There we are. Oh, Born in different countries nearly a century apart, these artists shape their narratives through a recognition of the power of faith to cope with the perils of migration from Italy and the vexing adjustments to various hostilities from the host country, America. I will argue here that through specific forms of community, sacred and secular, Immigrants and their children maintained their faith and transformed native-born Americans who held different religious traditions. Both the Progressive Era Settlement House and the influences of the religious orders of Catholic nuns effected important aims for Italian immigrants, enabling both a relaxing of rigid 19th century religious ideologies and an acceptance of non-traditional forms of Italian Catholicism in America historical underpinnings, and Italian Catholicism. Italian-American writers have, have historically responded with ambivalence and resistance to the institution of Catholicism as presented to their ancestors in America, and equally so in its belief in the continued subordination of women. While she admired the religious structures of the Catholic Church, including the liturgy of the Mass, Sandra M. Gilbert recognized that those structures for so long and so nakedly embodied and perpetuated the assumptions and oppressions of a patriarchal culture that defines those of us who are women as secondary and inferior, indeed, as basically vessels for the transmission of physical life. Writers of Italian America capitalize on the fact that the American Catholic Church at times misunderstood and delegitimized Italian Catholicism, thereby underemphasizing the preeminent role of women to influence entire families. The church's scornful attitude hardly <coughs> dissuaded Italian women from practicing their religion, even if they were not welcomed in its doors. As Linda Ardito explains, Italian immigrant women represented the link between home and church. Unlike the men who did not regularly attend mass, 
or by, by doctrines of the liturgy, the women represented the family in fulfilling such religious duties as hearing mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation. An Italian-American woman's position in this regard was so influential that Protestant denominations would appeal to her if they were to secure a possible conversion by other members of her family. One of the central features of Italian Catholicism brought to American shores is the religion of the home, a concept tracing to the Romans for whom religion begins in the home, centered on family relations and the casa. The religion of the family extends in concentric circles outward from the home to the neighborhood, city and country, ultimately to the natural universe. Religious studies scholar Robert Orsi, right down the street over at Northwestern, refers to this emphasis on the moral world of Italian America, the centrality of the Madonna, and the space of the ethnic enclave as the domus, a conceptual figure that included non-family members and the actual physical spaces where Italian Americans settled. There's a copy of his wonderful book that came out, I think, in 1985, still extremely useful. A uh, confluence of factors accounts for the difficult situation for Italian Catholics who came to America with their spiritual beliefs intact. These include an Italian Catholic popular religion practiced in Italy, which has already been mentioned several times, the migration to America of Italian Catholics, making second only to that of Ireland, and the response of the hierarchical church in America to Italian immigrants. Make no mistake about it. Italian immigrants were deeply Catholic, yet their devotional practices in America were perceived as unacceptable to the official church. In his analysis of Italian Catholicism, historian Rudolf Beckley explains that the peasants were intensely parochial and traditional, and traditional while nominally Roman Catholic, theirs was a folk religion. Two observers of Italian America, Phyllis Williams in South Italian Folkways and Leonard Cavello in The Social Background of the Italo-American School Child. Uh, these, still, these books are still super important, um, at least for me throughout my career in Italian American studies. Express a two monads model originally examined by, examined by Gabriel uh, De Rosa, a paradigm which suggested that Italy was divided into two camps. On the one side stood the church, which worked to promote official Catholicism, and on the other side were a variety of economically subordinate groups, mainly peasants, who clung to beliefs and practices inherited from dim pagan pasts. Sociologist Michael P. Carroll suggests that popular Catholicism in Italy indeed was shaped by priests in local churches, already mentioned today, challenging the assumption in the scholarly literature on immigrants of an unnecessary binary between official forms of Catholicism and local traditions. American scholars of Italian immigrants have traditionally erred in minimizing the role and significance of the Catholic Church, maybe because most of them were sort of unreconstructed radicals from the 60s, creating a false dichotomy between local practices and the role of the church offering a transnational perspective on the relationship between Rome and U.S. Catholics between the years of the Risorgimento to the rise of fascism, Peter D'Agostino, already mentioned today, in contrast to earlier disclaimers made by perceiving a dialectical relationship between the institution of the faithful, explains that modern Catholics within states forged an imagined community with myths, shared symbols, and a calendar of prescribed rituals. The Holy See in the Eternal City was the center of this community. Migration to America brought Italians in conflict with their religious practices in an entirely new way, increasing the tendency of scholars to separate official Catholicism from the popular brand of religion practiced by subaltern peasants throughout all of 19th, early 20th century Italy. The story of Rosa Casatelli, a northern Italian orphan from Lombardy epitomizes the coexistent links between popular forms of Catholicism and proscriptive ideologies of church authorities in 19th century Italy. Rosa's adoption of the Madonna as her true and only mother, a paragon of liberation and justice, enables Rosa consistently to emulate altruism toward others, regardless of her own suffering and poverty. 
plenty to confess. Rosa Casatari's faith and the piety of folklore. Guided by verbal markers that defined her life, Rosa's prowess as a teller of tales emerged from the communal and spiritual traditions of her rural peasant culture absorbed in childhood. Several voices inform the tales Rosa tells to Marie Paul Atz, her interlocutor at the Chicago Commons Settlement House, where Rosa worked as a cleaning lady for 40 years. Chicago listeners hear Rosa's old world, oh, there's the Chicago Commons Settlement, that's one of the pictures, uh, uh, tale-telling traditions of the stables, where such stories took place in her Italian community and which were influenced by conservative religious principles and a rigid caste system. Rose's personal stories to Marie include narratives about justice with prolific illustrations of the inequality between the classes and about divinity influenced by folk religious beliefs in the supernatural and imminence of the divine, especially the Madonna, who becomes Rose's most treasured listener. Once Rosa is encouraged by Marie to tell personal experience stories, which includes a powerful migration narrative, she becomes not only the narrator of her own life, but simultaneously the voice of justice and faith as she merges her own life story with features of folk tales in which triumph is victorious over adversity. Rosa's connection with storytelling began in Utero. Orphaned at birth in around 1866, Rosa is left at a baby depository in Milan. Infant abandonment in Italy by mid-19th century included a high percentage of newborns, many of them dying in their first year. Illegitimate children were stigmatized by church and civil authorities, referred to as figli della popa, children of blame placed in a torno or a ruota, a kind of turnstile, the abandoned infant could be left anonymously. Even before Rosa is adopted by foster parents in rural Cugiono and learns the art of storytelling, she has in, within her the makings of a triumphant story. Cultural anthropologist David Kurtzer references stories of abandonment and redemption from the two founders of Rome to the man who led the Israelites out of Egypt to distinguish such sacred and legendary texts from the untold thousands that died under this mass system. So when ordering Rosa's stories, Marie Hall S. felt attracted to the story of redemption, literally beginning Rosa's biography with her abandonment at the Milan Foundling Hospital focusing on this orphan's triumphant survival, beating a system that thwarted so many others. Recognizing her fortune, Rosa reiterates the fact that on the day, the day of her birth coincides with the Purificazione di Maria, aligning herself spiritually to a Mar Marianist sensibility. This identification confers upon Rosa a magical relationship with the Holy Mother, who, as Maria Warner explains, occupies a mediating position as a creature belonging both to earth and heaven. And I, I love this one uh, image of the Madonna. She's so happy. Um, and you rarely see a smiling Madonna. So I, I, I took these images from the Warner book. Um, and then, of course, the famous one of the peasant Madonna sitting on the ground. From the, and, and I'll refer to that again. From the enclosed confines of the Ruota to the literal jail in which she was, Rosa was placed after her biological mother claims her, uh, Rosa's body was unceasingly subject to brutal surveillance and, her, and the regulatory controls of religious and civil authorities. Through a combination of ingenuity and verbal skill, Rosa manages at age six to escape a dire situation when she retells the story of her triumphant escape from her birth mother, using the practical realism of the peasant to accept the fact that her birth family didn't love her. Rosa subsequently tells another equally inspiring escape story from Missouri to Chicago after she migrates to America, making this flight comparable, not comparable not only to immigrant narratives, but also to female slave narratives demonstrating a coextensive relation between transcendence and communalism. 
the Chicago Common Settlement House becomes the primary locus for Rose's genial memories of a painful Italian past, and significantly, the pivotal space where she gains local fame in America as a storyteller. Founding director Graham Taylor, influenced by the spirit and ideals exemplified by Jane Addams at Hull House, just a little further south, opened the doors to the commons the year after the Columbian Exposition in 1894. Excuse me. Dry. Okay. If you can control your breath, you can control your life. <laughs> Yoga mantra. Okay. Where was I? Where was I? Opened the doors to the commons the year after the Columbian Exposition in 1894, in the midst of the Depression of 1893, the worst the nation had known up until that time. Despite undervaluing the very people he aimed to serve, Graham Taylor built a settlement house located in the middle of one of Chicago's poorest neighborhoods and manned it with middle-class volunteers like Marie Hallettes providing tenement dwellers a haven from hostility. Here begins Rosa's long-standing relationship with the Chicago Commons. Despite its limitations, the settlement house helped Rosa learn English and provided her enough remuneration to keep her family out of the most anomic poverty. As a space for the demonstration of Rosa's verbal dexterity, the settlement house cannot be underrated. Reigniting her passion for tale telling, Chicago Commons gave Rosa access to an audience. That Rosa unites the activities of work and storytelling reinforces the fact that telling stories is as basic to her survival as work. Before she is fully fluent in English, Rosa recalls the trepidation she felt when invited to speak to middle-class tenants living at the Chicago Commons. Inspired by versions of Italian folk tales originating from the great tradition of Commedia dell'arte, Rosa employs improvisational comedy and the perfor performative art of gesturing and voice inflection to transform her listeners. That Rosa shares a story of the imminence of the Madonna is no small accomplishment for a minoritized person in early 20th century America who is an Italian, an immigrant, a Roman Catholic, a working class domestic, and not fully fluent in English. Rose's own description of her personal feelings and verbal process bear full citation. I can't do justice to her, but I'll read it. Me, I was always the one that liked to entertain the people. So every noon, I used to tell a story to the other cleaning women in the commons when we were eating our lunch in the kitchen. In that time, I didn't talk much English, but I acted out those stories so good that they understood me anyway. I made those women bust out laughing when I told some of those funny stories from the barn in Bugierno. One day, Miss Hill, the housekeeper, came and heard me telling. She was so crazy for the way I told the story. She went and told Dr. Taylor. Then Dr. Taylor found me one night and said, come in the parlor, Miss Cavallari, and tell the stories to the residents. Next page. Me, I felt like one penny the first time I went in before all those high up, educated people. And I tried to talk, half, but I had to talk half in Italian. But I was so reverent and acted the story so good that when I was the sister seeing the Madonna come alive, all those residents raised up from the chairs with me. After them, I all the time had to tell the stories to everybody, to the women's club, to the man's meeting, to the boys' party, to the girls' party, to everybody. Sometimes when they had big meetings in Hull House, they would tell me to come there. One time, that university in Evanston <laughs> made me come there and tell stories to those teachers going to school to learn the storytelling. I went everywhere. <laughs> Isn't that great? I just, that's one of my favorites, OK? Um, Rosa Cassateri's storytelling expertise demonstrates the verbal power to liberate both working and middle class listeners. The Madonna comes alive for her audience, the middle class tenants, literalizing their transformation by standing up during Rose's performance. Like Italian-Americans' engagement in processions and feste, I've got one here from New, uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, um, Rosa transfers her religious fervor onto non-Catholic audiences who respond to her performance.
performance as though observing the paraded statue coming to life themselves. And here's the second image that I found here from the Uptown in Chicago, 1985. Through storytelling, Rosa fulfills the function of ceremonial processions as she affirms her listener's sacred membership in her community of faith. Like Rosa, they are not seeing the Lord, but the preeminent figure of Italian Catholicism, the Madonna, whose ministrations on behalf of Rosa empowered her throughout her life. Rosa's storytelling reflects the ubiquity of her voice that is once emancipatory and performative as she builds community and dilutes class and cultural distinctions, collapsing boundaries between sacred and secular. All this because of her vocal agility. Part two. Nearly a century later, Italian-American writers continue to examine the connections between ethnic enclaves like those in Chicago and the effects of Catholicism, Catholicism on immigrant Italians to American shores. Chicago-born Tony Artizzoni is one such writer and a canonical one for Italian-American studies. Artizzoni destabilizes, there he is, the given history of what has been called the Second Great Migration of Southern and Eastern Europeans to the Americas during the 40-year period of 1880 uh, to 1920, before the 1924 Immigration Act. By turn of 20th century, uh, Italy experienced a 50% mi returning migration keeping alive the localism Italian nationalists sought to overcome. But after the golden doors were closed, migrating Italian women experienced a new reality once reproduction took place in the diaspora, laying a foundation for incorporation into countries where migrants lived and worked. I'm helped there by Donna Gabaccia's work. Artizzone's revolutionary Madonna, Anna. In the garden of Papa Santuzzo, Tony Artizzone's Tour de Force was published in 1999 at a major publication house, Picador USA, an imprint of Macmillan. In the Garden is a novel that pays homage to multiple literary traditions, offering a textual repertory that both overwhelms and delights as it initiates readers into a persistently elusive and magical world. On the back cover, a blurb reads this way. Not since Christ in Concrete have we had a novel so rich in language, so strong in story, so vivid in its telling, and so filled with history that it can be read over and over again. In the Garden of Papa Santuzzi should be, Tuzu should be required reading for everyone who is or knows an American of Italian descent. If Fred Garifay doesn't know how to write a blurb, I don't know if he does, because these are the kind of blurbs, I don't, don't get me on my high horse here, that need to be on these kinds of books. They're that, it's that important. Um, so thank you for that, Fred. Writing, uh, written for Chicagoland's Italian-American newspaper, Fran Noy. This commendation by Gardefei also alludes to an early vocal ventriloquist of Italian America, Pietro Di Tenato, whose 1939 best-selling Christ in Concrete was an autobiographical Pilgrim's Progress. Art of Zoni's textual, textual repertory pays equal attention to narratives of Italian America as he does to European canonical authors such as Boccaccio and Chaucer. In an effort to place the diasporic experience of Italians, specifically Sicilians, on the map, Art of Zoni plays the role of historian, folklorist, and contemporary magical realist refusing to dictate a master protocol of reading through an all-knowing narrator. Rather, the author structures his novel around stories told by 12 voices, all relatives in-laws of Papa Santuzu, the Sicilian patriarch who initiates the migration of each of his seven children, justifying their leave-taking out of a sense of paternal compassion for their impoverishment, uttering maledictions at a system of belief that would require more sacrifice from poor people than from God's only son, Papa Santuzu exclaims, I sent them away! I did! All seven! God sent only one! Seven against one! There are some things on earth in the lives that we live that are more sacred. 
Aware of the importance of intertextuality, Art at Zoni employs rhetorical conventions with documentary value. Prefacing his novel with epigraph, epigraphs from Booker T. Washington, Karl Marx, Luigi Pirandello, and proverbial Sicilian culture. Such a paratextual convention roots the fiction firmly in historical actuality, shaping the narrative that follows, merging stories of the visible and invisible, winners and losers, literate and illiterate. Artizoni's Sicilian characters are as different as the variegated colors of their island nation. Yet they share a tradition, Artizoni explains, based on the fact that the characters don't read, that they tell the stories they have heard and will tell again. Echoing, I put this up here, professional, uh, Joya, uh, professional storyteller Joya Timpanelli's comment that narrative time informed by storytelling mean that the story is kunta, e sera kunta, is told and retold. This is a lovely book as well, Joy's book. Artizoni's extends his focus on justice, equality, and the rights of the poor in the voices of second generational children born in America but bred on Sicilian folklore. The Black Madonna, his chapter, constitutes the longest and arguably most radical chapter in this long novel in its feminist contestation of the patriarchal Madonna of institutional Catholicism. Anna Gergenti, the daughter of Luigi and Cecina, is sent by her father to a New York orphanage after his wife in having a second child uh, in childbirth. Nearly killing her father in self-defense, Anna shifts from defensive violence to a love of peace through a belief in equality and prayerfulness. As such, she inhabits a folk world in which the Madonna and saints re resemble peasant men and women. As Lucia Piavola Birnbaum explains, in the vernacular world of Madonna, closeness to the church signifies distance from goddess, God. Vicino alla chiesa, lontana da Dio, and there's her, uh, copy of, uh, cover copy of her important book. As in many areas of the world, in southern Italy, there are places where a major object of worship is the Black Madonna, Mo Mary, mother of Jesus, in her aboriginal mother goddess aspect. Unsurprisingly, then, the Black Madonna appears to Anna in seven visitations, and I've tried to put several slides up here of different versions of the Black Madonna, um, in the chapel of the orphanage, enabling the young girl, despite violent protest by the white church fathers, to become the revolutionary spirit informing Arizone's novel. The ongoing conflict between the religion espoused by church doctrine and the spiritual experiences of subaltern people is encapsulated by the apparition of the shift-changing Madonna, who denies hierarchy and insists on her equal position as the Holy Ghost of the Trinity. And Jesu and I are twin souls, and one with God the Father. Constitutionally unable to tolerate equality, the priests respond to Anna's recounted description of the Madonna's appearances to her by parroting the received wisdom, spouting racist, sexist, and xenophobic comments. The priests are countered at every turn by a singular priest whom Anna describes as the dark young priest, who, for the sake of argument, challenges each insupportable assumption they make reminding the men that Anna's experiences of seeing a dark-skinned apparition is perfectly in line with her native Sicily, closer to Africa than it is to Rome. Despite the Vatican's later refusal to acknowledge the miraculous powers executed by what the people in the neighborhood call La Madonna Nera, another image, Loretto, her shrine continues to hold sway over scores of pregnant women and sick and invalid children. In adulthood, Anna Gergenti spends years in East Africa doing missionary work and re-witnessing the miraculous apparition of the Black Madonna in the faces of the beautiful Eritrean people for whom it was my blessing to care. As Birnbaum explains, the indigenous goddess of old Europe merged with African, Middle Eastern, and Asian dark goddesses and persisted in the Christian era in vernacular beliefs and rituals associated with Black Madonnas. 
The term vernacular connotes submerged beliefs visible in the everyday activities of peoples. Dismantling hierarchical and patriarchal institutions, Ardazzoni, through his creation of Anna Gergenti, insists on the fundamental vernacular belief in equality with difference, shifting from veneration of the crucified male to love of the living female, marking the beginning of, quote, God's third order, 2,000 years of rule by the Black Madonna, the Holy Ghost, and the third face of God. So, Madre de Jesu, Esposa de Dio, I am mother of Jesus, wife of God. As justice is the central value that emerges from studying the Earth Mother, the appearance of the Black Madonna to Anna symbolizes the not-so-concealed figure of Justizia, the goddess of justice. Anna's private experience, her lived life, becomes the official public record of historical injustice perpetuated by the church. The church's refusal to acknowledge the efficacy of La Madonna Nera, renaming her instead Our Lady of the Orphanage, invites Artizone's slate of hand when, toward the novel's conclusion, he offers tribute to the great and holy woman known more simply as Mother Cabrini, founder of the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart, as well as countless orphanages and schools, convents and clinics and hospitals, each devoted to the care of the poor and the needy, and particularly the immigrants from Italy. It is she, Mother Cabrini, in one of her clinics, who saves Anna's father, Luigi, from dying after being struck ill, working as a day laborer out west, having inhaled poisonous powder sprayed in the fields to guarantee high crop production. Despite the fact that Mother Cabrini was later recognized as a saint by the institution of the Catholic Church, she continued a life of unencumbered service to the impoverished and was known by the weak and disempowered to have supernatural powers. I like this book um, by Mary Frances Sullivan, um, helping a lot on Mother Cabrini. The ongoing conflict between powerful institutions of church and government and the folkloric beliefs of poor peoples is encapsulated by a folk story in which the mother figure of Francesca Xavier Cabrini holds the higher power of moral law against the robber barons of American industry, Andrew Carnegie, John Jacob Astor, and John D. Rockefeller. Arizoni embraces the figure of justice through a folkloric vignette on Mother Cabrini, who is a revolutionary sister of the Madonna with a glowing face circled by a bright halo of stars. These are her papers when she became a citizen, and I, I wanted you to see them. Um, and I think she became a citizen in Seattle at the age of 59. Um, so it was exciting. She, she really went all over the country and did so much work. Final paragraph. Tony Arizzone challenges many aspects of formalized history and its religious equivalents, illuminating the limitations of the archive, the reliability of its recording, embracing in, instead the unofficial personal record that comprises his multi-vocal novel, In the Garden of Papa Santuzu. Tying up his novel with the voice of a storyteller that frames the beginning and ending of his narrative, Ardizzone's choice of the name Rosa to perform this activity is both homage and serendipity. Rosa's final vision in the garden embraces the historical Rosa reaching across a century to share a vision of reunion without suffering. Just true songs and stories. And I'm going to quote from Arizoni's last page of the novel, a couple of lines of poetry. And may the Holy Mother bless and heed most dear all whose eyes read these words, all those gathered here. Thank you for your kind attention.